Book three, chapter six of Strangers and Pilgrims by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strangers and Pilgrims, Book three, chapter six. Quel mortel ne sait pas dans le sein des orages où reposer sa tête à la bruine des naufrages? Et moi, joué des flots, seul avec mes douleurs, aucun navire ami ne vient frapper ma vue, aucun sur cette mer où ma barque est perdue ne porte mes couleurs. Three months before the Sunday on which Elizabeth went to the little Episcopal church among the hills, Malcolm Ford had come home, a very shadow of his former self, to renew the strength that he had spent in the fatiguing service of his mission. Not disheartened or disgusted with his work did he journey homeward, only intent upon returning to that beloved labour in a little while, with a frame made vigorous by the cool breezes of his native land, and mental powers that should have gained new force from a brief season of rest. Infinitely had God blessed his endeavours in that distant world, and infinite were his hopes of future achievement. He had not mistaken his mission upon this earth, the work prospered under his hand, he was of that stamp of men who are by nature formed to be leaders of their fellow-men, created to convince, to subjugate, to rule the weaker clay which makes the mass of humanity. He came home to Scotland in no manner depressed, though he felt that his health was shaken, that he had laboured just a little longer than prudential considerations would have warranted. Not cast down, although he fancied sometimes as the good ship sailed homeward, that he should never again cross those blue waters, never finish the work so well begun. "'If not I, some other one,' he said to himself in tranquil resignation. "'I cannot believe that labourers will be wanted for so fair a vineyard. Let me be content if I have been suffered to see the beginning of that glorious end which I know must come in God's good time.' before that wonderful day when the dead shall arise from their graves and alice fraser and i shall see each other again he thought of his first love whose bridal robe had been her winding sheet whose undefiled image rose before him pure and stainless as an angel's and then with unspeakable bitterness he thought of that other love so much more fatally beloved who had stained her soul with the deep shame of a loveless marriage who had bartered purity and truth and honour, her life's liberty, her soul's independence, for the pomps and vanities of this world. He went back to Lenorgi. Those he had best loved were sleeping their quiet sleep in the old churchyard among the hills, but there were old friends still left to give him cordial welcome, and he spent the drowsy summer-time pleasantly enough in the restful calm of his native place. His small estate was let to strangers, even the house in which he was born, but he found a comfortable lodging in one of the farmhouses on his own land. He had just sufficient society to make life agreeable, and ample leisure for making himself acquainted with the better part of that mass of literature which had been produced during his absence, literature whereof very little had reached him on the other side of the Pacific. In this manner he spent a couple of months, then, finding his health in some manner restored, started on a walking tour from Loch Rannoch to Loch Lomond, resting wherever the fancy seized him, sometimes spending half a week at some quiet out-of-the-way inn, where the herd of summer tourists came not, fishing a little, reading and thinking a great deal, with hope that grew stronger as his physical strength revived, taking the business of pedestrianism altogether quietly, and varying his work according to the humour of the hour. Thus, after the best part of a month spent upon ground which the British tourist scours in a couple of days, he came to Dunallan, where he had an old high school and college comrade of days gone by, in the person of the Reverend Peter Mackenzie, whose duty he had promised to take upon his own hands for a couple of months, while Mr Mackenzie and his family enjoyed a holiday in Belgium. For the first week of Mr Ford's residence, the Reverend Peter was to remain at Dunallan, in order to introduce his friend to his new duties, and make him feel at home in the snug little Gothic manse on the hillside, which was a great deal too small for the Mackenzie olive branches, but was so arranged with infinite management on the part of Mrs Mackenzie as to contain a permanent spare bedroom. 
the juvenile mackenzies inhabited certain dovecot-like chambers in the gables which might have been rather large for a pigeon but were a good deal too small for a child except upon the principle that nature will adapt itself to anything in the way of surroundings the little mackenzies might have carried their bedrooms on their back like snails without being very heavily burdened but they thrived and flourished notwithstanding and whooped and gambled like young scions of the macgregor family in that clear mountain air in this hospitable abode where he was almost killed as juliet proposed to slay romeo with much cherishing mr ford intended to repose himself for seven or eight weeks counting the light duties of this small parish as the next thing to idleness before returning to his labours at the other end of the world he hoped to start in november and thus escape the severities of a british winter which he felt himself ill prepared to face it did indeed seem to elizabeth as she drove homeward at a reckless pace that sunday afternoon as if life and the world were new again as if a new force had set the warm blood racing through her veins as if the very air she breathed had a magical power and the landscape she looked upon was glorious in the light of a new sun it was only a little burst of afternoon sunlight a sudden break in the dull grey sky that beautified the hills but to her it seemed no common radiance in the skies no common loveliness in the landscape i would be content to live on just like this for ever she thought if i could hear him preach every sunday lord paulyn was enjoying the tardy sunshine before the gothic porch of slogner dyack as his wife drove her ponies up to the chief door of the chateau he was smoking a meditative cigar but not in solitude his friend mr lampton a turf magnate who had exchanged speculation in manchester soft goods for the more hazardous operations of the turf was lounging on an adjacent rustic bench and his toady in chief mr ferdinand spink a gentleman who combined a taste for literature with a genius for billiards supported himself against an angle of the porch in a state of supreme exhaustion while seated in the glastonbury chair within the shelter of the porch appeared the graceful figure of hilda disney it was altogether a pretty domestic picture the viscount planted on the threshold of his mansion his cousin close at hand his friend and flatterer on either side like the supporters in the family arms and how little i am wanted here thought elizabeth with the old feeling of dislike and suspicion about hilda um, been to church asked lord paulyn coolly yes been doing goody goody for the lot of us i'm glad you stick to that sort of thing it's ballast for the rest of the family i thought you were going to afternoon church said elizabeth turning to hilda with a faint suspicion in her look well she changed her mind and stayed at home to talk something over with me answered the viscount she's worth half a dozen stewards i go to hilda when i want a wrinkle about the management of my estate she didn't live the best part of her life with such a jolly old screw as my mother for nothing i can tell you hilda made no acknowledgment of this dubious compliment did you like the church at dunallen she asked well it's much better than that cast-iron oven elizabeth's face flamed crimson for a moment as she spoke the old transient flush like the reflection of evening sunlight miss disney marked the vivid colour and wondered what there could be in a strange church to call for blushes you had a good sermon i hope as a reward for your six-mile drive yes answered elizabeth curtly she went into the house passing her husband without so much as a look he had hilda hilda's counsel hilda trained in that sordid school at ashcombe hilda whose genius was to suggest the saving of money her bosom swelled with anger and contempt anger against both contempt for both why did he not marry his cousin and leave me to my lonely life leave me to be true to the memory of malcolm ford she went up to her own room the room with the stone balcony looking over the water the soft blue-grey wavelets which flowed beneath the hills that hid dunallen how strange how sweet how sad to know that he was so near her 
he from whom she was parted for ever oh if i had been constant to him if i had been content to live my blank miserable life in that wretched little house at hawley to be dragooned by gertrude to creep on my dull way like a snail that's never been outside the walls of some dismal old kitchen garden if i had spent all those years in thinking about him and grieving for the loss of his love would heaven have rewarded my patience and brought him back to me at last could i by only a little self-denial only a few years patience have been so blessed at last no i will not believe it to think that would drive me mad she sat in the balcony looking down at the water dreamily with folded arms resting on the broad stone balustrade sat living old days over again in a mournful reverie that was not altogether bitter nay rather perilously sweet for it brought back the past and the feelings that belonged to the past with a strange reality memory opened the gates of a paradise like that swedenborgian heaven in which all fairest earthly things have their shadow types and from the things that had been her thoughts wandered to the things that might have been the life she might have lived had she been true to malcolm ford he would have made me a good woman she thought and what have i been without him her newly awakened conscience reviewed her past life a career of frivolity and selfishness unleavened by one charitable thought or noble act she had lived for herself and to please herself and heaven as if in anger had snatched from her the chosen delight of her selfish soul the child whose influence might have redeemed her useless life drawn her world-stained soul heavenward dark was the picture of her life to look back upon darker still her vision of the future growing estrangement between her husband and herself her power lessening daily as her beauty decayed sinister influences at work to divide them and on her own part an apathy and disgust which made her shrink from any attempt to retain her hold upon his affection the booming of the great gong in the hall below reminded her of the common business of life but hardly awakened her from her daydream she hurried to her dressing-room and suffered herself to be arrayed for the evening and went down to the drawing-room where the viscount and his friends were dispersed upon the ottomans in all manner of attitudes expressive of extreme prostration feebly pretending to read newspapers or look at the pictures in magazines while they sustained muttered discussions about the odds against this horse or the chances in favour of that they made a little pretence of picking themselves up and drawing themselves together at the entrance of lady paulyn mr spink the literary gentleman said something funny in the saturday review and water style about scotch sabbaths but not receiving the faintest encouragement returned to the study of bell's life in a state of collapse oh, i don't know what's the matter with her ladyship this evening he said afterwards in a burst of confidence but she looks as if she was walking in her sleep never was sleepwalker less conscious of her surroundings than elizabeth that night she performed the duties of her position mechanically made very fair answers to the inanities which were addressed to her smiled a faint cold smile now and then turned the leaves of the book she pretended to read after dinner caressed the privileged hound who stretched his long limbs beside her chair and laid his head among the silken folds of her dress her favourite companion at times and fondly devoted to her always if the strangeness of her manner were evident to the careless eyes of mr spink a gentleman who considered the universe a clever contrivance designed as a setting for that jewel spink it was much more obvious to the eyes of hilda disney eyes that were sharpened by a jealousy which had never slept since the day when reginald paulyn first betrayed his admiration for the vicar's daughter what could have happened within the last few hours to bring about so marked a change that pale set face those dreary awe-stricken eyes as of one who had held converse with the very dead what could these denote it was not an edifying sunday evening by any means 
the scottish underlings of the household shivered as the click of the billiard balls made itself heard in the servants hall an hour or two after dinner but how could the viscount and his friends have lived through the day without billiards elizabeth looked up from her book after a long reverie to find herself alone with hilda in the great empty drawing-room only they two sitting ever so far apart like shipwrecked mariners who had been cast ashore on some desert island and who were not on speaking terms i hope there's nothing the matter lady paulyn said hilda you are looking so unlike yourself to-night elizabeth stared at her for a moment doubtfully with that almost vacant look which had startled mr spink oh there's nothing the matter uh, only i am i'm tired of this place already why we've been here only a few weeks and reginald likes the life so much that does not oblige me to live here the place would kill me i can't endure the solitude it makes me think too much i should go mad if i stayed here this from her who a few hours ago had thanked god for her scottish home had deemed it joy and peace unspeakable to breathe the air that was breathed by malcolm ford to live from the beginning to the very end of every week cradled in the hope of seeing him for a little while on sunday yes she had thought all this but conscience had awakened with much thinking and she began to feel that even in this delight which involved no hope of meeting him face to face of being forgiven of hearing him speak her name with something of the old tenderness even in this there was sin danger in the most common sense of the world there could be none for was not malcolm ford as a rock against whose calm breast the waves of passion beat in vain but she knew there was peril to her soul in this vicinity she knew it by the passionate yearning that filled her heart as she sat by this joyless hearth and thought of the life that might have been had she held by her treasure when it was hers to hold if she had not at least for a little while loved earthly pomps and vanities better than malcolm ford i can quite imagine that the exertion of thinking must be a new sensation after your life in park lane said miss disney with her icy sneer but wouldn't it be as well to encourage the habit the world will hardly be big enough for you if you always run away from thought and as you grow older you would find the exercise useful as a way of getting rid of winter evenings you remember what talleyrand said to the young man who couldn't play whist what a melancholy old age you are preparing for yourself elizabeth did not trouble herself to dispute the justice of these observations she started up from her seat went over to one of the windows and flung it open with a sharp decisive action that indicated a mind overwrought innumerable stars were shining in the deep dark sky stars that shone upon him too she thought as she looked out upon them with that old old thought which has thrilled the soul of every man and woman who ever lived at least once in a lifetime did he recognise me to-day as i drove past him does he know that i am near does he think of me and pity me and regret the foolishness that parted us oh no to regret would be sin and he never sins lord paulyn came into the room while his wife was standing at the open window listening idly to the slow ripple of the waves looking idly at the glory of the stars lost in thought quite unconscious of anything that happened in the room behind her he came in alone languidly yawning miss disney beckoned him over to her with a somewhat mysterious air oh what's the matter hilda how confoundedly solemn you look i am afraid lady paulyn is not well oh bosh she was well enough at dinner she's been giving herself airs i suppose let her alone as i do and she'll come round fast enough oh no no it's not that but i really think there is something strange about her did you not notice something in the expression of her face at dinner oh, i've left off watching her looks i know she's a remarkably handsome woman and she knows it and she's given herself no end of airs on the strength of her good looks 
but there are limits to a man's patience and my stock of that commodity is very nearly exhausted do you remember what you told me about her illness after the death of your son the viscount started frowned and looked at his cousin with suppressed anger do you remember telling me that there was a time when the doctors feared that her mind would never recover from that shock i told you what the doctors said but the doctors are humbugs they had a good case and wanted to make the most of it i never thought anything of the kind myself but why the why do you bring this up to-night don't be angry i am only anxious for your sake as well as hers there is something very strange in her manner to-night of course it may mean nothing only it is my duty to warn you oh hang duty cried lord paulyn impatiently i never knew duty urge any one to do anything unpleasant the moment any one mentions duty i know that i am in for it he turned upon his heel paced the room two or three times in an angry mood and then went out to the balcony where his wife was standing what are you doing out here star-gazing he asked the reply came in a softer tone than he was accustomed to hear from elizabeth's lips i have been thinking a great deal this evening reginald and i am going to ask you a favour oh please don't call me capricious or be angry with me for asking it and if you can possibly grant it pray do what the deuce do you want he asked ungraciously more money i suppose you didn't make a clean breast of it the other day when you gave me your bills though they were heavy enough in conscience name it isn't anything about money i want you to take me away from this place i know it is very beautiful i thought at first i should never be tired of the mountains and the locks and the sea that lies beyond but the solitude is killing me oh do let us go away reginald anywhere i should be happier anywhere than here ah i thought as much cried lord paulyn with a hard laugh i thought there was some plot hatching between you and hilda you'd both like to spread your wings i dare say you'd like to go to paris or baden-baden or hamburg or brighton some nice crowded place where you could spend money like water oh, no my dear elizabeth when i brought you here i brought you here to stay i know slogland isn't lively but it's healthy as the doctors all acknowledge and for the time being it suits me very well i came here to diminish my expenses and i mean to stick here till i've filled the hole you dug in my bank balance by your extravagance last season what cried elizabeth with ineffable disdain you are here for the sake of hoarding your money you bring me to this out-of-the-way place in order that i may cost you less why don't you send me away altogether you could save more money that way i could live on a hundred a year then i'm sorry you've never tried the experiment since you've been my wife oh, give me back my liberty let me go and live somewhere abroad under a feigned name alone my own mistress free to think my own thoughts away from this wretched artificial life which at its best seems to me like acting a part in a stage play let me do that and i'll not ask you for a farthing i'll live on the pittance that belongs to me a very safe offer even if you meant it which you don't replied lord paulyn coolly no i married you because i was fool enough to be fond of you and i'm fool enough to be fond of you still but there comes an end to the period in which a man rather enjoys being twisted round his wife's little finger i've been pliable enough i've let you have your full swing i half suspected when you refused to have anything settled upon you that you meant to spend my money all the more freely that you didn't want to be limited to a few hundreds but meant to make ducks and drakes of thousands i think i've borne with your extravagance pretty well from this time forward however i mean to pull up and nurse my income 
as my mother nursed the Ashcombe estates for me. The three years of my married life have cost me about six times as much as the same amount of time in my bachelor life, and yet I didn't stint myself of any reasonable indulgence, I can assure you. "'What if I had some special reason for asking you to take me away from this place?' pleaded Elizabeth, without noticing her lord's harangue. "'A woman always has a special reason for wanting her own way,' answered Lord Paulyn, with a sneering laugh. "'Well, so be it,' she said, raising her drooping head and looking at him with flashing eyes. "'I will stay here, then. But remember always that I begged you to take me away, and that you refused me that favour. I will stay here, since you insist upon it, and be happy in my own way. Pooh, be happy in any way you please, so long as you don't worry me with this kind of thing. Oh, come now, Lizzie, be reasonable, you know. Let us retrench this year, and I'll give you a month or two in Park Lane in the spring. Of course I'm proud of you and all that sort of thing and I like to show you off. Only you've contrived to make it so confoundedly expensive. And what other happiness do you suppose I expected when I married you, except the pleasure of spending money, she retorted in her coldest, hardest tone. Upon my soul, you're too bad, he cried angrily. You're not the first woman that's married for money by a long way but I should think you're about the first that could look a man in the face and tell him as much without blushing. And with this reproach he left her to go back to his friends and smoke a moody cigar in their congenial society. End of Book 3, Chapter 6「Henceforth I fly not death, nor would prolong life much, bent rather how I may be quit fairest and easiest of this cumbrous charge, which I must keep till my appointed day of rendering up, and patiently attend my dissolution.' A strange unrest came upon Elizabeth after that Sunday evening, a slow consuming fever of the mind, which in due course had its effect upon the body. The knowledge of Malcolm Ford's vicinity quickened the beating of her heart by day and night. Her sleep was broken by troubled dreams of their meeting. Her days were made anxious by the perpetual question, how soon would accident bring them face to face, or would he come of his own accord to see her? deeming the past buried deeper than the utmost deep of a fine lady's memory, come to visit her in his sacred office of priest, come to solicit help for his poor, support for this or that benevolent object, come to make a ceremonious professional call upon the lady of Slog Nadiak. The days went by, and he did not come, and she told herself that she was glad, yet she kept count of all visitors with a strange watchfulness, and was fluttered by every sound of the bell at the chief doorway. In her walks and drives the same fatal thought pursued her. At every shadow that fell suddenly upon her pathway, at every approaching footstep, she would look up, trembling, lest she should see his tall figure between her and the sunlight. Was it a hope that buoyed her up from day to day, or a fear that troubled her? She scarcely dared to ask herself that question. Sometimes she stayed indoors all day, seized with a conviction or a presentiment that he would come upon that particular day. He would call upon her, and speak gently of that poor dead past, and assure her of his forgiveness, and give her good counsel for the guidance of her life, and teach her how wisely to tread the dangerous path she had chosen. But that day dragged itself slowly out like all the rest, and he did not come. So passed a week. On Sunday she ordered her pony carriage and went to Dunallen, dreading that Miss Disney might offer to accompany her. But the discreet damsel forbore from any such intrusion. She had made her inquiries during the week, and knew perfectly who was officiating in the absence of the incumbent at Dunallen Church. 
your preacher at dunallen must be much better than ours here she said standing in the porch as elizabeth passed by to her pony carriage to tempt you to violate the scottish sabbath on two consecutive sundays i do not think it any more wicked to drive on a sunday in scotland than in devonshire answered elizabeth oh nor i i was only thinking of the custom of the country i know at ashcombe we had a strong inducement to make a long journey to hear your father's curate oh, that mr ford who preached such splendid sermons and seemed always so terribly in earnest he went to some outlandish place as a missionary did he not yes oh, what a pity you need not bewail the fact he has returned and is in scotland i am going to hear him preach to-day you can come with me if you like answered elizabeth with a splendid look of defiance as much as to say whatever sins may stain my soul they shall not be the paltry sins of deceit and suppression oh, oh no thanks i will come some other sunday said miss disney curiously discomfited by this unexpected candour she had taken so much trouble in a secret way to ascertain the fact which elizabeth declared so recklessly not carelessly or indifferently for her eyes sparkled and her lips quivered and the fever flush that had come and gone so often of late reddened her cheek miss disney had a spare half-hour before the morning service at the iron chapel leisure in which to pace slowly to and fro upon the lawn before the norman gothic porch thinking of her cousin and her cousin's wife did she seriously mean to injure either of them or deliberately plot the ruin of her fortunate rival oh no nor had she any thought of a day when death might sweep that rival from her path and she herself be lady paulyn she knew her cousin reginald too well to hope for that knew that his brief fancy for her had never been more than an idle man's caprice and had perished utterly ten years ago knew that whatever wealth of affection he had to bestow he had squandered upon his wife knew that there was no farther outcome of feeling to be hoped for from his selfish soul that whatever love he could feel whatever self-sacrifice he was capable of love and sacrifice alike would be wasted upon elizabeth she hoped nothing therefore had no scheme no dream only stood by like the chorus in an old tragedy or prophesied to herself like a mute cassandra but she had loved her cousin had in that distant unforgotten day cherished her golden dream of a happy prosperous existence to be spent by his side and she could not see him quite as he really was in all the utter commonness of his nature as for her feelings towards elizabeth well it was hardly to be supposed that she should love the woman who had stolen from her that crown of life which she herself had hoped to wear the woman who after having robbed her of this treasure scarcely took the trouble to be civil to her no she did not love her cousin's wife what shall i do she thought as she walked to and fro i can understand the change in her now the change which only began last sunday afternoon it was the shock of seeing this man again and she goes to-day to hear him preach and will contrive to see him perhaps after the service oh, what ought i to do warn my cousin that his wife's old lover is living within a few miles of him or hold my tongue and let him make the discovery for himself he is sure to make it sooner or later and i do not owe him so much devotion that i need put myself in a false position to save him a little trouble so miss disney did nothing and suffered matters to take their course contemplating the situation in a cynical spirit prepared for anything that might happen it seemed as if the old dowager's gloomy prophecies and she had prophesied about the various evils to come of her son's marriage with the convulsive fury of a pythoness on her tripod were in a fair way to be realised it really seems hardly worth while to hate anybody actively mused miss disney 
for the people one dislikes generally manage to do themselves the worst injury that malice could wish them sooner or later this sunday was finer than the last the autumn sun shone with rare splendour the little church at dunallen was full to overflowing the word had gone forth throughout the neighbourhood that mr mackenzie's substitute was a fine preacher a man who had done good service as a missionary too people had come from a long distance to hear him elizabeth felt herself a unit among the crowd there was no fear that he would be disturbed by the sight of her she thought yet she had a seat tolerably near the pulpit the pew-opener having been eager to do her honour a seat at the end of an open bench in a diagonal line with the preacher how sweet a sound had the familiar prayers when he read them what a sound of long ago full of old sad memories of the churches at hawley and her dead father's kindly face they filled her soul with tenderness and remorse oh, how wicked she had been all her life how hard how selfish she was not fit to worship among his flock how many and many a time sunday after sunday her lips had gabbled those prayers mechanically while her worldly thoughts were wandering far away from the fane where she knelt it seemed as if his voice gave a new meaning to the old words stirred her soul to its profoundest depth as the pool was troubled at siloam not for a long while hardly since her girlhood when she had fitful moments of religious enthusiasm in the midst of her frivolity had she felt the same fervour blended with such deep humility all the fever and excitement of the last week was lulled to rest in the solemn quiet of that little church among the hills again she felt that it was enough for her to be near this saintly teacher whom she had once loved with but too earthly a passion enough to be near him and that she might be good for his sake a better wife even i will try to do my duty to my husband she said to herself as she sat listening to the sermon her eyes bent on the open book in her lap not daring to look up lest his eyes should meet hers strangely dreading that first direct look the stern recognising gaze of those dark eyes of his after this gap of time his sermon was upon duty a straight and simple discourse adorned by no florid eloquence but made touching by many a tender allusion to that lovely life which is the type and pattern of all human excellence he spoke of the duties which belong to every relation of life of children and of parents of husbands and of wives it was a sermon after the apostolic model friendly counsel to his new friends here among the remote scottish hills far away from the falsehood and artificialities of crowded cities a simple pastoral address to the people of this small arcadia if i could only obey him elizabeth thought at this moment a different creature from the brilliant mistress of the house with the many balconies the presiding genius of crowded afternoon tea-drinkings the connoisseur in ceramic ware who would melt down a small fortune into a service of eggshell sevres or vienna or karl theodore cups and saucers and cream jugs and tea canisters for the mere amusement of an idle morning a widely different being from her whose last ball had astonished the town by its reckless extravagance whose milliner's bill would have been formidable for miss kilman's egg by nature a creature of impulse carried away by every vain wind of doctrine she was at least accessible to good influences as well as evil and was for this one brief hour exalted purified in spirit by the power of her old lover's pleading pleading not as her lover only as one who loved all weak and erring human creatures and had compassion unawares for her does he know she wondered does he know that i hear him oh surely he must have cast one of his penetrating glances this way nothing in his tone or manner indicated the surprise or emotion which might have accompanied such a recognition if he had seen her the sight had not moved him the memories which shook her soul to its centre had no power to touch him he was like rock 
she remembered the old bitter cry that had gone up from her lips in those dreary days when she had waited for his coming back to her his heart is stone strange that a heart should be so tender for all mankind yet so hard for her there was a time when i thought my love was worth any man's having just because they told me i was prettier than other women yet he has shown me that he could live without it that he could have it and hold it and let it go without a pang not once during the half-hour in which he spoke to his listening flock had she dared lift her eyes to his face sweet though it was to hear him it was almost a relief when the sermon ended she breathed more freely stole one little look at the pulpit where he knelt saw the dark head and strong hands clasped before it and wondered again if he knew that she was so near then came the chink chink of the sixpences the gradual melting away of the congregation and she was standing before the gothic doorway this time donald did not keep her waiting the carriage was ready for her she drove home very slowly still wondering end of book three chapter seven book three chapter eight of strangers and pilgrims by mary elizabeth braddon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Book Three, Chapter Eight of Strangers and Pilgrims. Thou hearst the winter wind and wheat, nay star blinks through the driving sleet. Tap pity on my weary feet and shield me frae the rain, Joe. The bitter blast that round me blows, unheeded howls, unheeded falls. The coldness of thy heart's the cause of all my grief and pain, Joe lord paulyn left scotland in the following week to go to liverpool where there were races being run in the early autumn and his friends departed with him to be replaced by a relay of other friends when he returned to slochnadyack a return which was at present problematical there were a good many races crowded together at this back end of the year a late regatta at havre where lord paulyn had pledged himself to sail his yacht the pixie races at newmarket at pontefract at the curragh of kildare in all which events his lordship was more or less interested so the two ladies were left alone in the norman chateau to sit in the long tapestried drawing-room with its modern antiquities a kind of brummagem abbotsford collection which had filled the soul of the knife powder manufacturer with pride during his brief occupation of the castle they were alone and were fain to stay indoors for the greater part of the week during which period there was rain such rain as does at times bedew scotia's fair countenance rain persevering rain incessant cloud above cloud piled pelion upon ossawise on the mountain top and discharging torrents of water every tiny watercourse on the hillside a narrow thread of silver in fair seasons was broadened to a small cataract every lowland river overflowed its rugged banks and brawled and blustered over its stony bed with a turbulent air as if some long imprisoned spirits of the stream had broken suddenly loose and were eager to make havoc of the countryside very long and dreary seemed those rainy autumn days to the mistress of the chateau and her uncongenial companion elizabeth secluded herself in her own rooms and tried to read or tried to draw or tried to find a tranquillizing influence in her piano a broadwood with a sweet human tone in its music a tone that answered to the touch of the player and was not all things to all men after the fashion of some newer and more brilliant instruments she played for hours at a time played out her sorrows her brief flashes of joy which were at most the joys of memory her moments of exultation her intervals of despair played and was comforted or laid her head upon the piano and wept soothing tears she had nothing human on this earth to love the life that she had chosen for herself left her outside those small tepid loves or likings which are the pis aller of less self-contained spirits even the thought of blanche her favourite sister in these moments of despair inspired only a shudder 
she loved her dog better than anything else in the world except that one person of whom only to think was a sin and the dog being dumb seemed to sympathise with her or at least never uttered trite commonplaces in the way of consolation but looked up at her with dark solemn loving eyes and seemed to be moved with human pity when she wept on his broad honest head at last there came a break in the sky the clouds upon the hilltops rolled away and disclosed the blue heaven whose face they had veiled so long the cheerful sunshine brightened the waters cornfields and green pastures on the shores of butte ceased to be blotted out by the inexorable rain the world was born again as when noah's ark came aground on the topmost peak of ararat the occasional fine days of a scotch summer are apt to be very fine and this last glimpse of summer splendour crowning the brow of autumn was bright and glorious elizabeth was somewhat cheered by this change in the weather it gave her at least liberty nor was she slow to avail herself of this recovered freedom long before noon she was on the hills beyond sight of slogner those heathery slopes and narrow footpaths by which she went were swampy after the long rains and wide water-pools lay in every hollow like polished steel mirrors reflecting the high blue sky but it is no longer one of the characteristics of a fine lady to take her walks abroad shod in satin slippers and elizabeth stepped through mud and swamp with a fearless tread in her comfortable mountain boots oh sweet autumn breezes oh lovely world if one could only be satisfied with the delight of mountain scenery and wide blue lakes sleeping in the rare sunshine that week of rain seemed actually to have exhausted the evil propensities of the caledonian atmosphere one fine day succeeded another days whose serenity was only disturbed by half a dozen or so of showers or an occasional tempest of hail and elizabeth who defied brief showers and even transient hailstorms or the sudden obscuring of the heavens behind a curtain of black clouds presage of a passing hurricane wandered about the mountains in delicious freedom and seemed almost to walk down the demon of despondency and the sharp stings of remorse she rarely drove for she could hardly use her pony carriage without offering miss disney the spare seat at her side and she loved best to be alone quite alone without even donald the gilly seated behind her open-mouthed and empty-headed staring vacantly at the sky she liked to climb the hillside alone to wander alone among the sheep who were seldom scared by her light footstep or to sit upon some craggy bank where fragments of primeval rock seemed to be mixed up with the heather and the short mountain grass as if this part of the world had but just emerged inchoate and unfinished from chaos she loved to sit here alone her seal-skin jacket drawn tightly across her chest defying the autumnal winds in whose sweet freshness there was a sharp sting now and then like a faint prophecy of coming winter here she had time for sad thoughts time to repent the foolishness of all her life gone by and to long with how vain a longing that the past could be undone sometimes as she walked homeward in the beginning of the dusk foolish fancies would steal into her mind at sight of the white towers and pinnacles of slogner rising above the evening mists at the base of the mountain the thought of what her life would have been if she and malcolm ford had inhabited that northern chateau how every room in the great house would have been brightened and glorified by domestic love how sweet to go home from her walks and be welcomed by him how sweet to stand in the porch at eventide watching for his coming vain useless fancies which consumed her heart fancies which she knew to be sinful even but could not put out of her mind thus passed the second week of lord paulyn's absence and there was as yet no hint of his return elizabeth was still free to live her own life a life of utter loneliness the life of a woman who lived in the past rather than in the present free to wander among those solitary hills with the dog gregarek for her only companion wide and varied as had been her wanderings she had never yet crossed the path of malcolm ford she had almost left off hoping for or dreading any such encounter 
had she chosen to put herself in his way to take the village of dunallen in the course of her rambles or to loiter among the outlying cottages that sprinkled the hillside just around the village she would have been very sure to meet him but this was just the one thing which elizabeth in her right mind could not do nor had she languished to behold him as the fever-parched wayfarer in a dry land languishes for a draught of cold water could she have deliberately waylaid him she knew that to think of him was wrong and yet she thought of him by day and by night having long lost the empire over her thoughts but she was still the mistress of her actions and could keep them pure she made the most of the fine weather however without coming too near dunallen and even when there came threatenings of a change menacing clouds again brooding over the mountain peaks she was not alarmed and left slocknadiac as usual immediately after breakfast with the faithful gregaric at her side oh, you're not going out to-day surely said miss disney who had come down to the hall to consult the barometer the glass has gone back to much rain well i thought we ought to have screwed the hand to that particular point the week before last answered elizabeth much rain seemed to be the normal condition of scotland yes i am going for my constitutional i dare say i shall have a shower but i'm used to that i'm afraid you'll have a storm and there's not much chance of shelter among those hills it's really very wrong of you to run such risks oh, the risk of catching cold for instance said elizabeth contemptuously i never catch cold i sometimes think i have a charmed life unassailable by the elements you are very lucky in that particular as well as in so many others i can scarcely put my head out of doors on a damp day without paying for my imprudence with neuralgia or influenza oh how disagreeable said elizabeth looking at her absently come gregarek she walked rapidly away under the dull threatening sky leaving hilda in the porch looking after her thoughtfully what a miserable restless creature she is in spite of her prosperity she said to herself one ought hardly to envy her does she ever meet her old lover on those lonely hills i wonder no i scarcely think that he is not the kind of man to run any hazard of scorching his wings at the old flame and she well no i do not believe she is bad enough for that she only wanders about because she is discontented and still madly in love with the man who jilted her two hours later those ominous clouds upon the mountain resolved themselves to rain a dense driving rain that came down like a sheet of water and threatened to extinguish the landscape in watery darkness miss disney stood at one of the drawing-room windows watching the deluge good heavens if she is without shelter in such rain as this she thought not without compassion what is to become of her and then with a cynical bitterness if she were to catch her death of cold it would be very little advantage to me what is it that some poet says even in their ashes lurk their wonted fires but some ashes are quite cold nothing would rekindle them on the hilltops that blinding rain made a worse darkness a confusion of sound as it came sweeping down with a shrill whistling noise like the wind shrieking in the shrouds at sea while ever and anon came the hoarse roar of distant thunder shaking or seeming to shake even those deep-rooted hills elizabeth stood beneath the tempest looking helplessly about her the dog cowering at her side wondering what she should do she was very indifferent to small inconveniences in the way of weather but this was a tempest which threatened to sweep her off the mountainside to whirl her into the teeth of the welkin unsubstantial and helpless as a tuft of thistledown even gregarach the deerhound who should have been accustomed to this war of the elements shuddered and was afraid oh if there were a cave or anything of that kind handy she said to herself trying to look through the rain she might as well have tried to pierce the curtain of futurity itself 
the world was a thing expunged there was nothing left but herself her dog and the deluge the barometer was right for once in a way she said this is much rain but i thought barometers were things one ought to read backwards like gypsy women's fortune telling happily she was not unfamiliar with her surroundings and could hardly go astray or topple over a precipice unawares she had roamed the mountain too often for that in her two months of residence at slognadiac she stood quite still pondering while the pitiless rain drenched her garments reducing even the comfortable sealskin to a black shiny-looking substance from which the water ran not as from a duck's back but soaking the fabric thoroughly as it trickled slowly down what should she do where seek her nearest shelter yes she bethought herself at last of a place of refuge at the base of the lonely hillside on which she stood a refuge so insignificant that it had hardly impressed its image on her memory though she had looked down upon it many a time from this very spot an object which in her dire distress to-day came back to her indistinctly with a kind of uncertainty as a thing which might be real or only an invention of her own fancy yes she thought i do believe there is one solitary cottage down there at the very foot of this hill i have a vague recollection of seeing it and a thin thread of smoke curling up from its poor little chimney a miserable shanty of a place with grass growing ever so high on the roof but oh what a comfort it would be to find myself under a roof of any kind just now come gregarich old fellow we'll make for the cottage it was hard work getting down the steep mountainside in that blinding rain she had held up her little silk umbrella as well as she could against the violence of the wind she had now to furl it and make it her staff her feet slipped upon the sodden grass more than once during her slow descent and for the moment she fancied it was all over with her and she must roll down to the valley bruised and beaten to death in her swift course Ooh, such a nasty dirty death she thought with a shudder but the firm light feet kept their vantage ground the slender figure held itself erect against the buffeting of the wind and the force of the rain-drift and lady paulyn finally arrived only half drowned in the narrow road at the base of the mountain a lonely cheerless road at the best of times skirted by a rocky bank beneath which ran a deep narrow stream now swollen to the width of a small river a spot that was eminently unattractive except from the artistic and salvator rosa point of view a region of sterility and gloom which hopeless grief might choose for its abode where nature seemed in unison with man's despair where the braes never bloomed and the birds never sang oh yes there was the cottage just a butt and a ben grass growing high upon the steeply sloping roof the tiny square window obscured by a handful of hay stuffed into one broken pane and a fragment of linsey woolsey in another the very abode of desolation but still a roof to cover one elizabeth thought gladly the door was shut she knocked but no one came and then tried the latch and opened the door and peered in an action which even in that moment of extremity brought back the thought of the old days at hawley when she had stood at cottage doors with so light a heart so full of vague hope and unacknowledged love may i come in she asked gently unable to see whether the place was occupied so profound was the obscurity within her dog emphasised the question by a fortissimo bark even that loud inquiry brought no reply the place must be empty thought elizabeth and made bold to enter gregarach going before her with loud sniffings and a suspicious air the little wretched room was unoccupied but there was some poor apology for furniture in it a chest of drawers article most dear to the scottish mind a battered old table and one chair a few odds and ends of crockery on a shelf in a corner and a good deal of dirt there were signs of occupation too a straggling turf fire on the hearth and beside the fire an old black saucepan containing some herby decoction from which came a faintly aromatic odour odd thought elizabeth but i suppose the people are out at work oh poor creatures 
I wonder what work they can find to do in such weather as this. She took off her jacket, which seemed a mere mass of brown pulp, took off her hat, also sealskin, reduced to the same pulpy condition, and tried to shake off a little of the water which hung in every fold of her garments. She tried to put a little more life into the turf fire, to get something like heat out of it if possible, but it was only a lukewarm fire, and she looked about the room in vain for more turf or a faggot of wood. What a wretched place, she said to herself, and to think that some poor creature will come here for comfort by and by when his work is done, is thinking of it now perhaps, and longing for it, and calling it home. She thought of Slog Nadiak, her own suite of rooms, with their many windows looking over the water, the infinite luxury, the triumph of man's inventiveness exemplified in every contrivance that can make life pleasant. She thought of the dismal contrast between this home and hers, and of her own discontented mind, to which that costly chateau had seemed no better than a splendid prison. Oh, why cannot fine scenery and handsome furniture satisfy one's heart? she said to herself. Why must one always long for something else, for some one whose mere presence would make such a shelter as this tolerable, for some one in whose company one would have no thought of worldly wealth or worldly pleasure? She looked round the darksome little room, looked up at the low broken ceiling which was rain-blistered and stained, looked round with a sad smile. Oh, if Malcolm had married me, and poverty had reduced us to such a place as this, I would have been happy with him, she thought. I would have tucked up my sleeves and scrubbed and toiled and tried to make this wretched hovel bright and comfortable for him. It would have been my pride to bear deprivation, misery even, for his sake. I could then have said to him, You doubted me once, Malcolm, but is not this real love? She had seated herself in the solitary chair by the low open hearth, trying to get a little warmth out of the fading fire trying not to shiver very much with that wretched sensation of cold and dampness which had crept over her since she had found shelter in the cottage. She had opened the door two or three times and looked out, with a faint hope of seeing some indication of fair weather, or at least some lessening of the rain. But the water drops came down with a sullen persistence, came down as she had seen them fall day after day from her window, without a break in the watery monotony. I wonder if I shall have to stay here two or three days, she thought, while all the Slognadiac people are searching the country for me, oh, and a private detective watching all outward-bound vessels that leave the Clyde, lest I should have taken it into my head to run away to America. It really seems as if I should have to choose between staying here all day and all night, or walking home in the wet. If I could only see a stray boy, a native boy, inured to rain, I might send him home for a carriage. But looking for stray boys seemed almost as hopeless as watching for the ending of the rain. So Elizabeth shut the door and went back to the dismal hearth, which became every minute colder and more dismal, and to her own sad, useless thoughts. She was startled from her reverie presently by a sudden activity on the part of Gregarach, who had been quiet enough hitherto, having stretched himself among the ashes in the hope of getting warm, where he had lain until now, dozing fitfully, and looking up at his mistress wistfully ever and anon, as who should say, we might surely have found better quarters. Now he started to his feet, gave a short bark, like the sergeant's cry of attention, and ran to the door communicating with the other chamber of the cottage, a darksome little den, into which Elizabeth had looked when she first took shelter, a room which had seemed to her utterly empty. The door was a little way ajar. The dog pushed it open with his nose and rushed in. Elizabeth started up, not frightened, fear and Elizabeth Luttrell had ever been strangers, only anxious, while there flashed across her brain old stories of Scottish shelters and faithful dogs, whose sagacity had protected their masters from murder. I have my watch and purse, she thought, and all these foolish diamond rings which I put on my fingers every morning from sheer habit, just as a red Indian tricks himself out with beads and wampum. 
i should be a rather valuable booty and this cottage has an uncanny look at the best of times standing alone under the shadow of the hill and with that deep dark river running yonder ready to swallow up murdered travellers she was not frightened though it was not beyond the scope of possibility that this vision conjured up half in jest might be realised in hideous earnest that sad and bitter smile so frequent on her lips of late lighted up her face just now as she thought how such things have been and how lives more precious than hers had come to dark and terrible ending how well that swift river could keep a secret it would be so easy a matter to dispose of her the dog might give a little trouble perhaps but a knock on the head would make an end of him and what resistance could she offer then would follow a long and tedious quest rewards offered heaven and earth moved as it were on behalf of a lady of quality but the mystery for ever unsolved dark scandals invented perhaps her reputation tarnished by foul imaginations some people preferring the belief that she was living a shameful secret life somewhere to the simpler theory of her untimely death she could almost fancy what society would say of her in years to come when her husband had married again and forgotten her oh there was another lady pauline you know who disappeared in a curious manner no one knows whether she's alive or dead but lord pauline married again all the same his cousin a miss disney a much more suitable match the first wife was a very pretty woman and gave capital parties and so on but they did not live happily together and he would hear of her dark fate and wonder and be sorry oh yes surely even his stony heart would be moved by her dismal end that most horrible of all dooms at least to the mind of the survivors the fate about which there is uncertainty she had time for all these thoughts while gregarach was sniffing about the inner room presently he set up a piteous whine whereupon elizabeth with a calm fixed face as of one who goes to her doom pushed the door open again it had swung to behind the dog and went boldly into the gloomy den where murder perchance lurked in the shadow of the sloping roof the dog was standing with his forepaws upon a miserable little bed a bed she had not observed in her first inspection of the chamber a bed set into the wall cupboard fashion after the manner of some scottish beds the lower end enclosed by a wooden shutter the head sheltered by a checked blue curtain limp and ragged a withered skinny hand grasped this meagre drapery hardly the hand of a stalwart assassin the hand of a dirty waxen hue wasted by age or sickness and a feeble voice entreated plaintively oh take away the dog elizabeth ran to the bed oh don't be frightened he won't hurt you she said down gregarach down old fellow indeed you needn't be afraid of him he's a sensible affectionate fellow the dog licked his mistress's hand as if in grateful acknowledgment of this praise she had as yet seen no more of the occupant of the bed than that skinny hand clutching the curtain but the curtain was drawn back now revealing a ghastly figure a woman old or made prematurely old by toil and care and sickness a face haggard as death itself under a tumbled nightcap dim eyes staring at the intruder with vague wonder something to drink gasped this helpless creature oh for god's sake give me something the stuff that old becky made elizabeth looked round her helplessly she could see no sign of a cooling draught for those pale parched lips not even a pitcher of water much less the stuff concocted by old becky whoever that person might be oh, where shall i find you something she said poor soul i'll do anything in the world for you if you'll tell me how the stuff by the fire said the woman oh but dinner leave your own doggie with me the stuff by the fire that dark concoction in the saucepan the recollection of it flashed upon elizabeth she called her dog and went back to the outer room found a cracked mug and poured some of the dark looking drink into it and carried it back to the sick woman and held it gently to the dry lips 
supporting the weary head upon her arm with a touch of that natural tenderness which had endeared her to the cottagers at hawley have you been long ill she asked three weary weeks i've kept my bed three weeks but i was bad before all my limbs aching and a weight on my head i could hardly keep about to do for myself and my son he is a farm labourer beyond dunallen and then i was forced to give up and tuck to my bed for the fever has been mickle bad about these parts the fever repeated elizabeth with a faint shiver but not any shrinking motion of the arm that supported the sick woman's head oh yes it's been very bad maybe you shouldn't have been here oh, some folks call it catching but i dinna ken the lord knows where i could have caught it for there's few folks come my way to bring me so much as a fever except the new minister i suppose you're the minister's wife elizabeth smiled at the question no she said i'm not the minister's wife it was only selfishness that brought me here i was caught in the storm and came to your cottage for shelter but now i'm here i may be able to help to get you well i can send you wine and tea jelly and broth all kinds of things to strengthen you and a doctor too if you've had no doctor i've had old becky and she kens as much as any doctor and the new minister he knows a deal and he brings me wine and things but it's very little i can tuck and do i'm so low there's some wine in yon cupboard you might give me a drappy oh let me settle your pillow more comfortably first she arranged the pillow fever tainted perhaps the whole chamber had a faint fetid odour that tried her sorely but fear of death even in this den where lurked a foe scarce less deadly than the assassin of her imagination she had none the day was past when her life had been worth cherishing she placed the pillow under the weary head wiped the damp brow with her handkerchief murmured a few comforting words phrases she had learned in the brief period of her ministrations and then went to the cupboard a little hutch in the corner to seek for the wine the new minister that was he no doubt she touched the bottle almost reverently thinking that his hand had sanctified it the woman hardly put her lips to the cup it was only by gentle entreatings that elizabeth could induce her to take a few spoonfuls of the wine not all the vintages of a porto could have brought back life or vigour to that worn-out habitation of clay in which the soul fluttered feebly before departing for ever there was a bible on a chair by the shuttered end of the bed oh, will you read me a chapter asked the woman after an interval of feeble groanings and muttered lamentations elizabeth opened the book immediately chose that chapter of chapters that tender farewell address of christ to his apostles the fourteenth of st john and began to read in her low earnest voice as she had read many a time in the sunny cottages at hawley with the bees humming in the myrtle bushes outside the window the green trees waving gently under the summer sky this gloomy hovel in the shadow of the mountain seemed a bit of another world she read on until the patient sank into an uneasy slumber breathing heavily and then seeing her to all appearance fast asleep elizabeth laid the book down and looked at her watch it was nearly five o'clock the day which had been dark at two was growing darker the rain which she could just see through the cloudy glass of the narrow casement was still coming down steadily with no symptom of abatement oh it's clear i shall have no alternative between walking home in the rain or staying here all night thought elizabeth or stay this poor soul spoke of her son he will come home by and by perhaps and he might fetch the carriage for me there was comfort in this hope 
though not afraid of the fever she was not a little desirous to escape from that tainted atmosphere in which to breathe was discomfort and yet it seemed cruel to leave that helpless creature perhaps to die alone i must try and find a nurse for her somehow she thought i'll ask her about this old becky when she wakes it seems almost inhuman to let her lie here alone she wondered that malcolm forde had not done more for this stricken creature but there were doubtless many such in his flock and he had done his utmost in bringing her wine and coming to see her now and then the woman had been asleep about half an hour while elizabeth sat and watched her thinking her own sad thoughts when the outer door was opened it was the son returning from his work no doubt elizabeth rose and went to meet him anxious to have tidings of her whereabouts conveyed to slogner dyack before nightfall she had her hand upon the door between the two rooms when another hand pushed it gently open and drawing back a little she found herself face to face with malcolm forde she could see plainly enough that for the first few moments he failed to recognise her in the half-light of that dismal chamber he looked at her first in simple wonder and then with eager scrutiny good god he cried at last is it you oh yes she answered with a feeble attempt to take things lightly did you not know we were such near neighbours strange isn't it how people are drawn together from all the ends of the earth oh, parthians and medes and elamites and the dwellers in mesopotamia he seemed hardly to hear her he was looking at the bed with an expression of unspeakable horror come into the next room he said drawing her quickly across the threshold and shutting the door upon the sick chamber what brought you to this place accident i came here to find shelter from the rain you had better had stayed in the rain oh, but god grant you may have taken no harm i come here daily and stay beside that poor creature's bed for an hour at a time but i believe custom has made me fever-proof you must get home instantly lady paulyn and take all possible precautions against infection that woman has a fever which may be which i fear is contagious but i trust in god that your superb health may defy contagion if you are only reasonably careful he opened the outer door to its widest extent let us have as much air as we can even if we have some rain with it he said it's too wet for you to go home on foot i must find some one to run to slochner dyack and fetch your carriage oh you know where i live then with a wounded air it seems so stony-hearted of him to be quite familiar with the fact of her vicinity and yet never to have broken down the barriers of reserve never to have approached her in his sacred character to be careful for all the rest of his flock for all the other sinners in this world fiji islanders even and to have not one thought not one care no touch of pity for her yes he answered in his cool grave way imperturbable as the very rock looking at his watch thoughtfully the young man will not be home till seven perhaps i must go to slogner dyack myself what through this rain oh please don't you will catch your death of cold i came here through this rain and i am very well protected he said glancing at his mackintosh yes that's the only way promise me you'll stand at this open door till your carriage comes for you oh but if that poor soul should call me if she should be thirsty again i can't refuse to attend to her can i mr forde what you have been attending to her hanging over her to give her drink with a look of intense pain oh yes i've been arranging her bed a little and giving her some wine you brought and doing what i could to make her comfortable it reminds me of, of the old time at hawley when i had a short attack of benevolence oh please don't look so anxious i am sure not to catch the fever what is that line of somebody's death shuns the wretch who fain the blow would meet 
i'm just the kind of useless person who never dies of anything but extreme old age you'll see me creeping round hyde park forty years hence in a yellow chariot and a poke bonnet with pug dogs and a vinegar-faced companion hmm. you have not left off your old random talk he said regretfully i cannot forbid you to obey the dictates of humanity if the poor old woman should ask for anything you must give it but do not bend over her more than you can help and do not stay in that room longer than is absolutely necessary i have arranged with a woman at denallen to come and nurse her she will be here to-night oh i am glad of that and i shall still be more glad if you will let me contribute to your poor may i send you a cheque to-morrow you may send me as many cheques as you like and now good-bye the carriage will be here before i can return he gave her his hand with an air so frank and friendly that it stung her almost as if it had been an insult pressed the little ice-cold hand she gave him in his friendly grasp and went out into the rain oh he never 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 could have loved me she said to herself looking after him with a piteous face and bursting into a passion of tears what had she expected that he malcolm forde the man who had given his life to god's service would fall on his knees at the feet of lord paulyn's wife in the surprise of that sudden meeting and tell her how she had broken his heart five years ago and how she was still much more dear to him than honour or the love of god he looked frightened at the idea of my having caught the fever she thought when she had recovered from that foolish burst of passionate anger bitter disappointment unreasoning and unreasonable love but that was only from a philanthropic point of view just as a family doctor would have done was there ever any one so impenetrable one would think we had never been more than the most commonplace acquaintance and had only parted from each other a week ago she stood leaning against the doorpost looking at the dreary waste of sodden turf the fast flowing river the mountain on the other side of the valley which was like a twin brother of the mountain behind the cottage she stood thus lost in gloomy thought thought that was more gloomy than the landscape more monotonous than the rain when a footstep sounded a little way off she looked up and saw mr ford coming back to her i met a lad who was able to carry the message faster than i could he said so i have returned to prevent your running any risk by ministering to that poor soul yonder he looked into the other room the woman was still asleep he waited a little by the bedside and then came back to the doorway where elizabeth stood looking out at the turbid water how long is it since you were caught in the rain he asked a foolish question perhaps inasmuch as it had rained without ceasing for the last four hours oh i hardly know it seems an age i was wandering about the mountain for ever so long not knowing what to do till i happened to remember this cottage and then we came down my poor drenched dog and i and crept in here for refuge and i seem to have been here half a lifetime half a lifetime more than a lifetime she thought for were not the joys and sorrows of any common existence concentrated in this meeting with him the dog was licking his hand with abject affection as if he too had known this man many years ago and had been parted from him and loved him passionately throughout that severance but strange creatures of the dog tribe had a habit of attaching themselves to mr ford and you have been in your wet clothes all this time he said anxiously with the pastor's grave solicitude not the lover's alarm i fear you may suffer for this unfortunate business oh rheumatism or sciatica or lumbago or something of that kind she said those seem such old women's complaints i dare say i shall have a fearful attack of rheumatism and my doctor and i will call it neuralgia out of politeness no one on the right side of thirty would own to rheumatism this with her lightest good society manner i should recommend you to send for your doctor directly you get home and take precautionary measures i have no doctor she answered a little impatiently i hate doctors 
they couldn't save the child i love uh, her lip quivered and the dark beautiful eyes filled but she brushed away the tears quickly deeply ashamed of that confession of weakness you have lost a child said mr ford oh i heard nothing of that i know very little of the history of my old friends since i left england i did hear of your dear father's death and was deeply grieved but i have heard little more of those i knew at hawley not a word of her marriage but he had heard of that no doubt had heard and felt no surprise taking it for granted that she was engaged to lord paulyn when he set forth upon his mission i am sincerely sorry to hear that you have lost one so dear to you but god who saw fit to take your little one away may in his own good time please do not say that to me i know what you are going to say it has been said to me so often and it only makes me more miserable i could never love another child as i loved him the one who was snatched away from me just when he was growing brighter and lovelier every day i could never trust myself to love another child i would keep it a stranger to my heart i would take pains to keep it at a distance from me i should think it a dishonour to my dead boy to love any other child but don't let us speak of him i have been forbidden ever to speak or to think of him forbidden by whom by the doctors oh, i don't know what made me speak of him just now it's like letting loose a flood of poison water he looked at her gravely wonderingly with a look of unspeakable sorrow was it for this she had broken faith with him had all the splendours and vanities of the world brought her so little joy the wan and sunken cheek the too brilliant eye told of a heart ill at ease of a life that was not peace let us talk of yourself she said in an eager hurried manner i hope you found the life about which you had dreamed so long a realisation of your brightest visions oh yes he answered with a far-off look which of old had always suggested to elizabeth that she was a very small account in his life yes i have not been disappointed god has been very good to me i go back to my work at the close of this year and to work in a wider field you go back again back again to that strange world with a faint shudder how little you can care for your life and for all that makes life worth living for life itself for the bare privilege of existence in this particular world i do not care very much but i should like to be permitted to finish my work so far as one man can finish his allotted portion of so vast a work and the savages said elizabeth did they never try to kill you no he answered smiling at her look of terror before they could quite make up their minds to do that i had taught them to love me and you will go out to them again and die there for if they spare you fever will strike you down perhaps or the sea swallow you up alive in some horrible shipwreck how can you be so cruel to yourself cruel to myself in choosing a pathway that has already led me to happiness or at least to supreme content supreme content what you had nothing to regret in that dreary dreary world oh i know it's full of flowers and splendid tropical foliage and roofed over with blue skies and lighted by larger stars and washed by greener waves than we ever see here but it must be so dreary twelve thousand miles from everything oh from bond street and the burlington arcade and the royal academy and the opera houses said mr ford as if he had been talking to a wayward child do you not think that i am not tired enough of those things and this world she cried passionately why do you speak to me as if i were a baby that had never cut open the parchment of its toy drum to find out where the noise came from i asked you a question just now had you nothing to regret in your south sea islands nothing except my own worldly nature 
which still clung to the things of earth she looked at him curiously wondering whether she was one of those things of earth for which his weak soul had hankered his perfect coolness was beyond measure exasperating to her it was not that she for one moment ignored the fact that for those two there could be no such thing as friendship no sweet communion of soul with soul secure from all peril of earthly passion in that calm region where love has never entered she knew that this accidental meeting was a thing not to be repeated without hazard to her peace in this world and the next or to such poor semblance of peace as was still hers yet she was angry with him for his placid smile his friendly anxiety for her welfare the quiet tones that had never faltered since he first greeted her the grave eyes that looked at her with such passionless kindliness if he had said to her elizabeth i have never ceased to love you but we must meet no more upon this earth she would have been content but as it was she stood looking moodily down at the angry river dyed red with the clay from its rugged banks telling herself over and over again that he had never loved her that he was altogether adamant being a woman and not a woman strong in the power of self-government she could not long devour her heart in silence the wayward reckless spirit sought a relief in words however foolish you do not even ask me if i am happy she said or how i prospered after your desertion of me desertion he echoed with a short laugh oh, women have a curious way of misstating facts my desertion of you desertion is a good word oh forgive me for not having inquired after your happiness lady paulyn i had a right to suppose that you were as happy as every woman ought to be who has deliberately chosen her own lot in life i trust the choice in your case was a fortunate one i had no choice she answered in a dull despairing tone looking at the river not daring to look at him i had no choice i went the way fate drifted me as helpless or as indifferent as that tangle of weeds yonder carried headlong down the stream i was miserable at home with my sisters so thinking any kind of life must be better than the life i led with them i married i have no right to complain of my marriage it has given me all the things i used to fancy i cared about long ago when i was a vain silly girl nor have i any right to complain of my husband for he has been much better to me than i have ever been to him why do you palter with the truth he cried sternly turning upon her with an angrier look than she had seen in his face even on the day when they parted why do you try to disguise plain facts and to deceive me even now what pleasure can it give you to fool me just once more what do you mean by being drifted into your marriage or why pretend that you married lord paulyn because you were miserable at home you were engaged to him before you left your aunt's house you were married to him as soon as my back was turned that's false cried elizabeth i was not engaged to him till you had left england oh, what he was not your accepted lover when i saw you in eton place when i showed you that newspaper he was not the newspaper and you were both wrong i had refused lord paulyn twice the last rejection took place the night before that morning the night of the private theatricals at the rancho she held her head high now the sweet lips curved in a scornful smile proud of her folly proud even though she had wrecked her own life and had perchance shadowed his by that very foolishness and you suffered me to think you the basest of women to surrender that which was dearer to me than my very life only because you were too proud to tell me the truth would you have believed if i had told you i don't think you would you had judged me beforehand you would hardly let me speak you believed a printed lie rather than my piteous looks the love that had almost offered itself to you unasked that night at hawley 
you could think that a woman who loved you like that would change in two little months could be tempted away from you by the love of rank and money i never thought that you could leave me like that i was sure you would come back to me oh god how i waited and watched for your coming how i hated those fine sunshiny rooms in eton place which saw my misery and then when i went back to hawley thinking i might see you again perhaps and you might forgive me i was just in time to hear your farewell sermon and when i went to your lodgings the next morning to beg for your forgiveness yes i wanted you to forgive me before you left us all for ever i was just too late to see you fate was adverse once more the train had carried you away you went to my lodgings he exclaimed with breathless intensity you would have asked me to forgive you me the blind besotted fool who had been duped by his own passion you loved me well enough to have done that elizabeth oh, i would have kissed the dust at your feet there's no humiliation i could have deemed too great if i could have only won your forgiveness oh not won your love back again the hope of that had no place in my heart my love he said with a bitter smile when did that ever cease to be yours her whole face changed as he spoke glorified by the greatness of her joy he had loved her once and that once had been for ever but not long did passion hold malcolm ford in its thrall he felt the foolishness of his words so soon as they had been uttered oh it is worse than idle to speak of these things now he said if i wronged you by a groundless accusation you wronged me still more deeply by withholding the truth that day changed the colour of our lives of my life i can only say that it is the life to which i had long aspired which i would have sacrificed for no lesser reason than my love for you it has fully satisfied my desires i will not say there have been no thorns in my path only that it is a path from which no earthly temptation could now withdraw me for yourself lady paulyn i can only trust as i shall pray in many a prayer in the days to come when we too shall be on opposite sides of the world that your life may be filled with all the blessings which heaven reserves for those who strive to make the best use of earthly advantages oh, you mean that having made a wretched mistake in my marriage and having lost the child who made life bright for me i am to console myself by church-going and district visiting and by seeing my name in the subscription list of every charity mm, the field is very wide he said every trace of passion gone from voice and manner you need not be restricted to a conventional role there are innumerable modes of helping one's fellow-creatures and no one need despair of originality in well-doing it is not in me she answered wearily and if i were ever so inclined to help my fellow-creatures my opportunities henceforward are likely to be limited i have been guilty of culpable extravagance it is so difficult to calculate the expense of what one does in society and i was never good at mental arithmetic in plain words i have made my husband angry by the amount of my bills and i shall henceforward have very little money at my command i should have supposed that lady paulyn's pin money would be ample fund for benevolence which need not always be costly said mr ford conceiving this self-abasement to be merely a mode of excusing her disinclination for a life of usefulness i have no pin money she answered carelessly i refuse to have a settlement when a woman marries as much above her as i did there is always an idea of sale and barter i would not have the price set down in the bond well your husband will no doubt remember that generous refusal when he's recovered from any vexation that your unthinking extravagance may have caused him i don't know we have a knack of saying disagreeable things to each other i have not much indulgence to expect from him do you ever pass our house at slogner dyack sometimes 
Sometimes, she thought, with exceeding bitterness, and he'd never been tempted to cross the threshold, never constrained in his own despite, as passion would constrain a man who could feel, to enter the house in which she lived, to see with his own eyes whether she was happy or miserable. And yet he talks of having never ceased to love me, she said to herself. And then, resuming her old light tone, the tone that had so often jarred upon his ear in the bygone time, she said, Well, when next you pass Slognadiac, think of me as a prisoner inside those high white walls, a prisoner looking out at the water, and envying the white-sailed ships that are sailing round Kentire, the seagulls flying over the hills, it is a very fine house, and I have everything in it that a reasonable woman could desire. But I feel it's my prison, somehow. How do you mean? <laughs> well, Lord Paulyn has brought me here to retrench. He is a millionaire, I believe, but millionaires are not fond of spending money. <laughs> and, as I told you just now, I have spent his with both hands. Oh, pray don't think I am complaining, only... Only when you go past my house, think of me as a solitary prisoner within its walls, and pity me if you can. The assumed lightness was all gone now, and in its stead came piteous tones of appeal. Pity you? he cried passionately. Are you trying to find out the quickest way to break my heart? You had always a knack at playing with hearts, Elizabeth. Do not speak to me any more. Pity me, I am weaker than water. Why do you not tell me that you are happy, that the world and the pleasures and the triumphs of the world are all sufficient for you? Why do you wish to distract my soul by these suggestions of misery? And tonight, perhaps, amongst your friends, you will be all life and brightness, a creature of smiles and sunshine, as you were in the play that night. Oh, I can act still, she said with a faint laugh, but it's too much trouble to do that at Slognadiac. I have no friends there. It's a hermitage without the peace of mind that can make a hermitage pleasant. Oh, don't look at me so sorrowfully. I shall go back to London, I dare say, in the spring, if I'm good, and shall give parties and spend more money, while you are among your Fiji islanders. Malcolm Ford answered nothing but stood with a gloomy brow staring at the rushing water. What a shallow nature it seemed, this soul of the girl he had loved once and for ever! What a childish perversity and capriciousness! And yet what dreary suggestions there were in all her talk of a depth of misery lurking below this seeming lightness! What torture to part from her thus, knowing nothing of what her life was like in the present! what it might become in the future, knowing only that it was not peace, and that all those loftier hopes and noble dreams which had sustained him in the darkest hours of his existence were to her a dead letter. They kept silence, both watching the dark and turbid river, almost as if it had been that river in the underworld by which they must each stand one day, waiting for the grim ferryman. But in a little while the sound of wheels mingled with the noise of the water, wheels and horses' feet approaching swiftly on the wet mountain road. "'Thank God,' said Mr. Ford, "'the carriage at last. How you shiver! I must beg of you to remember what I said about taking prompt means to ward off the cold, and it would be as well to take some precautionary steps against infection. Not that I fear any danger from that,' he added hopefully." and then looking at her with undisguised tenderness, for was it not, as he believed, his very last look? Elizabeth, I shall pray for you all my life. If the prayers of any other than yourself can give you peace and good thoughts and a happy life, you will never lack those blessings. Goodbye. He held her hand for a little while, looking at her with those dark, searching eyes which she had feared even before she loved him, looking through her very soul, trying to pierce the thin veil of pretense to fathom the mystery within, but even at the last she was a mystery too deep for his plummet line. Goodbye, she said, 
and not one word more remembering that other parting when if speech could have come out of her stubborn lips she might have kept him all her life what could she say now except good-bye he put her into the dainty little brougham wrapped her in the soft folds of a fur-lined carriage rug gave the coachman strict injunctions to drive home as fast as his horses would safely carry him and then stood bareheaded at the cottage door watching her departure End of Book 3, Chapter 8